once again to the last part. We will continue with the community's tutorial. It is an important tool for traffic engineering. With this aim, I'm going to introduce Eduardo Barasal Morales, coordinator of the Information and Autonomous System of Citroën, Nick PR, and Claudio Nakamura, development analyst of Nick PR. Welcome to the two of you, and you have the floor. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Sí, podemos oírte. Okay, we're going to start this tutorial, but we're going to speak in Portuguese. So, if you wish, you can opt for interpretation, but we do understand some Spanish. So, if you wish to write something in the chat on any questions you might have, feel free to write in Spanish. But we're going to be speaking in Portuguese. Start. I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Eduardo Barasal Morales. I'm together with Diago Jun Nakamura. We're going to give this tutorial on communities. And how did we structure this tutorial? We're going to speak of one practical aspect on a theoretical part. To start, start, we're going to use the theoretical part explaining how to use these communities. And then we're going to see in practice how to apply these configurations to the BGP and how to have an influence in the best way. I'm going to share my screen now. To start with the theoretical part. So what do I have to share with you here? This has to do with the motivation. It is quite common to receive in the news information about cases of profile theft, problems with BGP, route leaking, and we heard quite a lot about this regarding manners. And many people have the idea that all these problems can be solved in the communities. But the thing is, this is not exactly like that. Communities are a very powerful to tool for autonomous systems, but this is not the solution to every single problem. It is going to be very helpful to you, but this is not the final solution to all problems. So, communities is part of the solution, but whatever you do with communities can also be done in another way. And this is what, did I, what, what I wanted to share with you. So, you can do a loop function to be more efficient, or you can also do all these things with several functions. What is more efficient? What is nicer? What is easier to do? The loop function is easier, and the same happens with the communities. When you have several functions that can be carried out in different ways that are not used by the community, but you can use, then configuration is simple, simpler. This can be easier to understand for another network operator. So it is very useful to have the communities. But what are these communities? Mun communities are like a seal. This is like a seal, but the seal doesn't bring anything new. This is just like a brand, like a mark. And the important thing is the function that you add to this. For example, when you look at the password, you have a seal, a stamp. This shows entry and exit from a country. When you visit another country, you have information stating that you entered the country and that you left on a given date. In other places, they also use the stamps. For example, if you go to a party, if you pay, you receive this stamp and this allows you to participate in that party. So this stamp has the function of allowing you to circulate at that party. And the community is the same thing. It's like a stamp that goes from one place to another, but provides information that will improve our routing policy. It's going to help us on routing policy issues. And that is why this is so important. So I'm going to speak about these communities. What are the communities? These are a PGP attribute added to a route. They are transitive and optional. You can use these or not. And this a route can have multiple communities attached to it. In other words, the route can have more than one stamp, one than, more than one mark associated to this. So you can have as many communities as you wish to try and use the traffic in the best way possible. There are three 
types of communities. You have the standard communities, the extended communities, and the large communities. I'm going to explain each of these communities so that we can then see how to use each of these. Now let us speak about the standard community, communities. They were defined in RFC 1997. The first version was from 1996. And these are quite old, but this means that they have been widely used. Many autonomous systems have used these standard communities. How do you identify a standard community? This is recognized through a 32-bit number. This is expressed in a format of two fields. Each field has 16 bits, like you see here, 16 bits, 16 bits, total on 16 bits. And this format, in addition to being easy for a network administrator, allows you to work as if this were a string. You can parse that information, so you will be able to work with text. Although it is a number, you can work as if this were a word. When you configure your routers. And you can perceive that there are two fields of 60, 16 bits each. So first, I take the first field, and this is the number of the autonomous system. But the number of the autonomous system today has 32 bits, and it does not fit in the 16-bit field. In the past, the autonomous system numbers did have 16 numbers. So this was old. But first you paste the first field and you paste your own autonomous system number to indicate that this was a community number. And then the other 16 bits are pasted there as if it were another number. So aqui. Eu comentei que hoje em dia a gente trabalha com números de sistemas. Which is the that you operate in that route. But I said that today's people work with autonomous system numbers that have 32 bits. In that case, some of the numbers of the autonomous systems are private numbers in order to use these standard communities. So it is important to use a community with a number that indicates that these are ours. And unfortunately, we cannot achieve this in the standard communities because we have the problem of the 16 bits. To solve this solution, we use a private option. Now, why do I like to highlight this? To avoid repetitions, because this was a transitive attribute. Very often, we see that the community started publishing several changes to the same path and these had not always been foreseen because the private number of the autonomous system means that there were another system that used the same number. So sometimes you see that a community that gradually added and started using it in one or the other and uh, sometimes it's the same rule because all followed the same tutorial in all those places that i mentioned so the standards exist they are broadly widely used and they have this uh, difficulty of not being able to put uh, the current uh, autonomous system number but uh, then in 2006 uh, they created the extended communities with a longer number, with 64 bits. And so when expressing the 64 bits, they did it in three large formats, separating into th these uh, groups. And look at this. They separated um, 16 bits for the type, as I show here on the slide. Then notice that what is missing bits for the autonomous system number and uh, so they generated a format uh, to put that and they use uh, for for the ipv4 address where if but uh, it's not enough for an ipv4 address but it's because it's much larger so and this 
type is already defined by IANA. So there's a list of the things that can be used. And but you don't end up uh, um, um, uh, solving the problem and you add a new complexity. And that is why it's not used so much as the standard. After some time, in uh, 2017, they created the large communities, and those were defined with uh, RFC 1892. The idea was uh, to uh, so that you could be able to put the ASN. So in uh, our routing policies, we um, could use them. Now we have 96 bits. It's a much larger number, and it's three fields uh, of 32 bits. That's a format. So it's very common to put in the first uh, field, you put the name of the ASN, in the second, the function, and in the third, you put a parameter. That is an additional information to uh, relate it to the function. So it is very common to do it with my autonomous system to do an action, and uh, that parameter is used as another ASN. If I wanted to add one in my autonomous system, so it's very explicit because in my community, my, my autonomous system does uh, something in another autonomous system. So it's a way of expressing it. This was created in uh, 2017. It's uh, being uh, increasingly popular, but some many don't use it. But that is because uh, as it is newer, people are sort of afraid of using it but we see that it works very well and that it should be implemented uh, more. Now, how to use the communities? We can uh, divide them into two categories. First, we have the informational uh, marking and the action marking. The information communities, well, they bring some reference uh, about uh, the route, some additional information. For example, what country did the route come from? Where did it, it originate? In, uh, did it originate in uh, the Brazilian autonomous system in such and such a state? So when doing traffic engineering or managing the uh, autonomous system, just by looking at the community, I already know where it originated, where it came from and what it should be doing in that route. So it brings information and for for the autonomous system and uh, the action marking is when we want uh, to influence the routing policies for instance i, I increase local preference for a given route so we have these two large categories now we are going to understand this with an example I'm going to take uh, the information standard communities and explain how we can work for them in an informational manner. I can put an autonomous system number, a private autonomous system, with these first uh, 16 bits and the other 16 bits. I can each integer can be the part of the information that I want to add. So the, for the team, I put relationship type, a transit peer. My ex, the internet exchange, or, the, or, or traffic exchange with a client, an internal route. So just by looking at the at this, I know that that route came from a transit. And what transit? Well, the next number, uh, the C, gives me the continent. So it's a transit from Africa, for instance, and so on. So we can put from, from for, let's say, for instance, Mozambique, or by region, by, uh, for instance, Southeast or Northeast, etc., and then the state. So each uh, letter gives you some information. So you handle it as if it were a word. So those are uh, digits, but uh, integers, but um, they represent uh, these. And um, that is for the standards, and we could do it too for the large communities. It's a way to manage uh, the information with this ASN, with the same autonomous system. In an, this field, I can put a function, and there I can work on, with 
a number of, the, for instance, the region code, uh, the country code, and the third field. So, and uh, um, the third would be the relationship. For instance, uh, dialing nationally. Of, and uh, so these are routes that were came from Africa, for instance, or the country code. We put number two. So there, this can be, for instance, uh, of, we can tell whether they are from Brazil. So we can manage the routing table using that information. And here I bring you some recommendations. Do not confuse the informational communities with action communities, because the informational communities bring information and uh, the action communities apply something in the routing uh, table. So it should be easy to identify each one. The informational communities uses uh, five digits and uh, the action communities use four digits. So when you go and look at the routing table, you're going to quickly identify whether it's a, an action or an informational community. And there you, you, you can tell and you'll be able to work better by telling them apart. Another recommendation is not to let others send you their information commun informational communities, filter them out, because you do that only for yourselves to working better in your network. So if so, filter it, because if someone starts putting communities in a site where you didn't want them, it's that's going to cause trouble. Imagine that you have a neighbor, a peer, that has the informational market and it's the route of a neighbor. And all of a sudden, the outside neighbor market that it's a, a community and for you it means that it's transit and that later on when you see that that is interfering with your routing so it's necessary to filter it if it's uh, your community then you clean them and that's it they shouldn't reach you the action large communities so showing uh, the large communities it's easier to see the concept can be extrapolated for other communities, including the standard. Uh, so let's see the action communities. We have the, here, this defines the autonomous system, then the function, and this third, the parameter. So um, including the, um, for instance, the function, it doesn't export to neighbors in country code X, uh, or does not export to ASX, or or, uh, and then the NP gives extra information that specifies the function. Uh, for instance, 076, 1, 076, do not export to AS in Brazil, or uh, defining the route. And there you can divide, uh, you can generate a function in the routing table. Normally, the recommendations um, uh, are to publish and update your documentation about your communities. You should do that because that will help you find and discover problems and solve them. And even to be, a, it will help you create filters. So publish the uh, your information because if not, it won't. Uh, the others won't be able to use it because you want the others to use it uh, so that they. Uh, you can tell them, I don't want you to export it to an IXP. So the rest, uh, the, the community, the action community, when they see that, they do not export it to any IXP. They send it to the transit because um, uh, they know that you don't want to send them there to cause uh, routing problems. After that, we... Um, to you want to encourage uh, your clients to uh, enter the action uh, communities. It may happen that you may have created an interaction community for the clients, not the client's clients, not somebody at the bottom. So you need to ask the clients to filter them. You only want to receive information about uh, changes in uh, the routing tables about the customers, so what your customers report. So 
if someone is trying to send any information, you filter it and there will be no problems and no changes will be made. Why do we warn you about this? Because you may have a, some, uh, um, the communities are a transitive attribute, they enter the route, and the good practice is that if that community is not for you, you let it out. Um, so when that is done for the uh, community, when it reaches a route with a community marking, you don't know who put it, the client or the client's client, because there is no information of who put it. So if we don't use that information, we need to pass it to others. And when you do that, when you pass it to others, we don't know at the end uh, who is going to influence the transit. Um, it may be one hop away or two or up to 10 hops away, but does it make sense uh, to uh, have an influence on uh, those that are so far? No, because uh, usually the impact is very small. Is it, uh, does it uh, um, uh, good to be uh, um, avoiding the traffic that comes from Asia? No, because we are working with the, with the customers in Latin America. So we're trying to have an impact on other transit that goes to China, to, to New Zealand or wherever. It may not be interesting because it's not far and we won't be able to have uh, the any any impact it won't change things for us the other recommendation that is interesting it's it's interesting to have a looking glass in the network so that the others when they apply the communities and um, as they are expecting uh, they can know that uh, this is happening in the in the tool that is Sometimes they put community, you put communities and nothing happens. You are going, are you using the correct uh, community? Are you using the wrong number? Did you forget to publish an update? Uh, so leaving a looking glass available is a way of helping the community. So I'm going to speak of the uh, XBR. We are seeing it, this, uh, in the side. And we are going to see in each PDT what community there is. And uh, you'll see how you'll see it in Rio Grande do Sul, in Fortaleza. So it's worth uh, reading this document and see if it's okay. So here we have all the communities and as in some regions, they are more advanced than in others. So the communities, some are in the phase an implantation phase and uh, we want uh, to see what's happening with the community. So we have traffic engineering você desligar a sessão BGP de maneira suave, sem que isso ainda interfira muito no seu tráfego. Você pode tentar influenciar, olha, de não... Você pode tentar influenciar e não anunciar a route para os sistemas autônomos na África, ou em APNIC, ou em Oceania. Oceania. So it might be that this might not be interesting. I don't want to announce for those places that's so far away. So with the Brazilian um routes and not announced to the others, announcements to the others in the world. So this is just an example for, for Europe, for LACNIC members. I have this option of export. So this is something quite new of the round trip type, the RTT, and this is the path of the latency and packet loss. So one, we can, this allows us to have an influence considering packet loss or the latency. If you have a participant who is in the traffic exchange point and is losing 
packets or has a very high latency, they can say, well, I don't want to worsen this. I don't want to announce this one. I don't wish to announce autonomous systems that have poor connection. So I set my right only to those who have a proper connection, those who have low latency or those who have limited packet loss. So these are some of the new things that we have. At the traffic exchange point that are worthwhile looking at. Here we have more information available for the traffic exchange points. Regard, for example, XPs from Africa, North America that you can take in order to take action. Here we have the RTT and the losses. What are the autonomous systems have poor routes? So you can decide whether you wish to filter these routes or not. We also have some filters. RPKI, a lot was mentioned about this in other tutorials. Here we put valid, invalid or not known for RPKI. We have the regional registries and we also have the BH, which is black holing, which I'll refer, we'll refer to later on. This is how to send a route to this black hole. These are some opportunities that you have. So, as I had said, we have to look at the table. Here you have the IXs in Brazil have that, those communities. For example, in Vitoria and in Campinas, these have the largest number of communities. Sao Paulo has some more in the sense that obviously if you compare the size to other communities, but most of the localities just have the basic option. And Sao Paulo has more than the basic. Vitoria and Camilas have almost everything. But I won't go into more details because this is just about looking at the table and then identifying these things. Now to explain how packet loss takes place and latency. In the case of latency, every 15 minutes a measurement is made. Then an average is made of the best results. 60% of the average of the best result is made. There are some windows, I think every three hours this is done. And then the route servers change the configurations every eight hours. This is updated every eight hours. One might be wrong, but then it is better. And this will change depending on whether this is identified and then update is made every eight hours. This, it takes some time to change the communities. Then we have packet loss. Measurement is done five times a day at night in Brazil. And we see that if there is a packet loss in peak times, then we do an average of the 60% uh, average of the best results. Now let us go over to the study cases. The thing that is most interesting to the communities is how to apply this and I'm going to refer to different cases with configurations that you can apply to your networks and benefit from this. Here we speak about prevention of route, route leakage. What is route leakage? This is when you receive a route and this should not be forwarded, but it is forwarded or a new path that should not exist in the internet. And if this route went forward, then this is what we could call a route leakage. Manners teaches you how to solve route leakage. Apply filter, prefixes and AS paths, but you need to know how to apply this filter correctly. Manners can do this excellently. You can look at the tutorials they have, which explain this very, very clearly. How do you, how you do the prefix filtering and the AS path? If I manage to do that with a filter, what, where do the communities come in? 
communities are not essential, essential, but they can help. Sometimes you have a problem with a filter, or you can confuse the update of the filter. So the communities can help you out with these things. So let us see how they can help us. We have this scenario with the autonomous system at the bottom, 64504, which owns the route DB8-32, and it is sent to 64504 and 64503. 503 is connected to the traffic exchange point and is sending the route forward to the IX and 502 also participates in the IXV. It also receives that route. So as I said, you can work with filters and prefixes. Here I can put a outgoing filter. So this would be 64501. And I say, okay, I allow this 2001 DBA to go to this one here. So 502 is receiving its front two different pages from the IX and directly from the owner who would be the 504. Through the IX, we have a worse route compared to the one that comes from the bottom. So by default, only the one from the bottom will go through, which is the best one, which is directly connected. But let us imagine that our link breaks down. This is where you have the red X. That is, filter is on 2001 DBA 32. It doesn't specify that this is from the client or from the IX. So in that case, the link is broken. I lose that route, but the filter will allow it to go through. It will allow this IX route to go to use this. So I use my, tra send my traffic through the IX. Is that what I wanted? No, it wasn't. I was, this, I was just a peer. I was part of a connection. I was speaking with all the different participants. I received the route from all the participants and it turned out that there was a route leakage. So I really became transit. And this is something which I didn't really want to know. Now, how can I solve this? So we could an SP filter and also a prefix. Here I put a prefix. That is why there was a route leakage. How could I work with the communities on this to help the configuration? I could state a community in the routers. This comes from the client. This comes from the IX. We're going to only let through that which comes from the client. If you have another community, I don't, I won't let it through. So in this case, 502 includes a community 64502 colon 10 and all the routes that come from here will receive this 64502 and will for sorry and goes to to here. In the outgoing router, I let those that have 64502100 community states that this comes from a client. I won't let other things go through. I just let the client's traffic go through. So if this link is interrupted once again, then I will look at my client's route within the IEX. So I won't be able to continue with my traffic, but there will be no route leakage. This is one of the ways you can use the communities. So we have the communities and the IX routes and the transit routes. You look at the routing table and then you will understand that this community belongs to a client. So this is that client that will have this exported through my transit traffic. Now let us look at another case of RTBH inside the provider's network. This is related to black holing. Many people would like to use this because of the increase of DDoS services. Uh, attacks, sorry, where we often we suffer these attacks. 
with a set of botnets that are out there in different parts. This was already mentioned, and they attack just one machine. So if I manage to use a community on a route that only goes in towards one machine so that the people rule out this traffic, this will help my provider. That is why the communities help with the, are useful for the black holing. So what is RTBH? It is remote triggered black hole. So how can you activate black holes remotely? This is through a router. You can trigger this towards several routers so that they take action. This can be applied inside the provider's network in the traffic exchange point, IXPR, and also in others, international IXs. I don't know each one of them because I, I'm, I don't know every single one, but I included two so that you can research this. These are the traffic exchange points to which you are connected and other providers. So we try to discard all the traffic that comes from an attack. So how does this work? Let's look at the providers. Everything begins when you create a static route. This goes towards the null, which is a trash. You take a slash 128 and you focus at the null. All the traffic that goes in that direction will be discarded. So you have a reserved address. We're going to discard that traffic. This is not an address that you, you're going to publish to another one. This is an address that is an internal one. We do this for all the routers. This is one that is called RTBH. Through that router, I'm going to act. What will be my action? I'm going to select all these. I'm going to take a router that has no traffic because when we receive a DDoS, all the routers start to become overloaded. So we really want to send a command and we don't manage to access the command screen because there is such a big load that we cannot do anything else. So we take a simple router so that we can trigger the information in that direction. We can then a, a route map. So all the routes that have uh, this 6x, I'm going to increase the local preference. I'm going to make it uh, preferential and I'm going to go to the next hole for the, the uh, address that I'm throwing uh, to uh, the uh, trash. Uh, the next step will be the trash. So the router that is marked uh, 66 will be showing the next uh, hop that is uh, the null. That is the solution. So we are going to try not to disseminate that uh, upstream that route or you may also try to send it to a community of a neighbor saying uh, telling him that uh, the black hole is already applied so he can do that so we go on so in the bgp you distribute that static route everybody in my autonomous system will receive uh, that static route through BGP and to activate it, you need to create a static route, only that. So I receive an attack in um, the machine, this one 2001 DB8F1CA-D1CA. Uh, this machine is uh, the one that has the null is being attacked. So I want to discard that because all that is trash and it overloads my network. So I create this static route and I create the attack um, 65. So they're going to take this route and they're going to see that this, um, they're going to um, send this uh, information to the routers in my net. So all the packets that go for 2001 DB8, um, F, F1, uh, 
CAD1, CA1 slash uh, 128. It's a way that I can discard what's not user so that I won't overload the network. So this is in our autonomous system. Now let's see what happens if you want a link that does the action in another provider. In that case, when action in another provider, the good thing is to use some prefixes. What we recommend here, for instance, is a slash 24 to slash 32, only accepting low prefixes. Why? Because it doesn't make sense if you send it to a black hole in community to send an entire block because the uh, DNA as uh, attack wants to interrupt the service of, of the provider. And if you send all the block, then you, the, the attack will be successful. So it, it doesn't uh, make sense to send large blocks, but small. When a client, two clients, three customers are under attack, we have a group of uh, customers. So we must accept in the blank black holding, we need to accept the small prefixes. So we put from 32, that is the most common in IPv4 and 128 in IPv6. So it goes down from slash 24 to slash 32. It may be a company or an entire organization that is under attack. So if you remove that uh, institution from uh, your network, the attack improves. So, but that institution will uh, lose internet connection. That's a problem of attacks. So that's one of the evils. Now, if instead of leaving uh, everybody without the internet, you leave only the one that is being attacked, only the victim of the attack. What is interesting here, when we explain that action of the black holing, we must not export toward others because we are already acting and it's useless to block that traffic, to filter it and to throw it to the trash bin and then afterwards to send it to the rest. It doesn't make sense. So we are only going to um, overload the others. So you r remove the community. So And it's also important to know whether the AS, whether the owner of the route that is sending to a black hole, it's because it must be the owner of the route. It's if it's not the owner, then maybe it's putting the community in a route that is not there. So it's uh, damaging other autonomous systems, and we don't want that. Now, so let's understand this with an example. I have a 64501. I need to create an RTBH community. Remember that it is common for people to use uh, the community 666 the number that represents uh, the devil, something bad. And so that shows uh, that this is an attack and this will go to the garbage can. So what do we do? We need to change the next hop to get uh, for a static route that will uh, be uh, directed to the black hole, to the garbage can. That's what we're going to do in the transit um, and then that will disseminate the uh, route in the community and you create the route that aims at the trash bin in all the routers. And that is done in the transit provider. When you receive an attack here, we are here in 64502, but 64501 is the one that needs to apply all the configuration so that you can send everything to the garbage can. So, because you said it to the uh, action community, and uh, actually, this is an attack that is coming against you. So, we need to ask the transit provider to create that black holing. When you create a community of that black holing, you can use it. And so, 64502 starts receiving the attack and marks with the community that 501. Uh, can receive the documents that can use and then afterwards you have to create a route because it's a very specific route it's a, where the attack is going and when he creates that route that is exported in the bgp and sends it to the autonomous transit autonomous system and that is how it starts to get filtered it starts with the configurations uh, 
in the transit. So you ask to discard the transit that comes uh, to your machine, that is uh, 2001 DBA, DBA Cafe, 128. This, so this machine is under attack, so you're sending that router to the black hole in community and the transit is filtered. So some more cases. Here we have a common case of uh, um, to export. And so the idea is not to send routes. Uh, here we use uh, the uh, loss of uh, uh, packets that I ex showed you earlier. And it's interesting that uh, in Brazil, you see the original in the looking glass. So you can send it to IXPR, uh, putting the obligation to use that. So here we are in the autonomous system 64503. And I don't want to export to 64501. So 64500. Um, so then afterwards, he, he doesn't want to send this. So it's going to tell that and it won't be exported to the autonomous system so it sends uh, through that uh, router and the server will send that to everybody except for the one that you said that shouldn't receive it the one that you had specified so he shows that he did that in the looking glass so afterwards you can enter the looking glass and check it another case and it's even uh, the opposite case i only want to export to this autonomous system and not to others so sometimes you want to export the route to some but not to everyone think of the except uh, sao paulo the, there are uh, already too many participants um, i uh, 1900 i don't want to send the route to 1900 i only wanted to send it to 100 so it is interesting to use uh, the reverse logic. In this case, I can mark them. I only want to import to 64501. So we go to the list of the communities of IXBR and I, we choose the one that we want to use. And then we see the standards, the large, the extended communities. You have to see which is being used. You mark it and you send it to the route server. So. Uh, so here I only wanted to export to 64501 and that is uh, what the root server is going to send, but uh, the others won't receive it. And then you can check this in the looking glass. So I'm about to finish this, then I'm going to give Tiago the microphone. And Tiago is going to present the hands-on part with the routers showing how you do things. So this concept is applied in Juniper, Microtech, uh, in many vendors. Many of them already use the large communities. It's not so complicated. I don't know whether you have any comments, any questions. We still have about two, two minutes. We can also have an interval until the questions are ready. So uh, we'll leave some time so that you can have the questions. Hernan, could you tell us whether we have any questions for Eduardo in this part of the tutorial? Anyway, we invite you to write down any questions you may have about this topic. Please uh, make the most of it because you have Eduardo and Tiago and uh, you can ask them any doubts you may have. Remember also that for a better understanding of the languages, you can have an access to simultaneous interpretation that is in the toolbar at the bottom of Zoom platform. We're going to give some more minutes. Hernan? No, we don't have any questions in the Q&A yet. Nothing in the panel. 
So let's wait uh, a few seconds more and see if anybody dares. There are no bad questions. Remember, this is your opportunity to write down all the questions you may have. Okay, I want to thank Eduardo and Tiago for this first part of the tutorial. There, there's a question in the Q&A. It's by Gustavo Figueroa. He says, good afternoon. In the community, do you add the ASN? Does it apply for IPv4 as well as for IPv6? In the community, do you add that? Sim. É, bom, vou, vou responder em português. Uh, yes, as let me answer in Portuguese. The communities may be applied in IPv4 and in IPv6 uh, routes, that's independent, that is an attribute of uh, a BGP, and here I show some examples. Um, you can use it with any of the two. Here it's in IPv6, but it can also be used in IPv4. So, thank you, Eduardo. Are there any more questions in the, in the panel? No, there are no more questions. So, thank you, Eduardo, for this first part. We'll now have a brief pause and we'll be back with the second part with Tiago. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm Tiago, and together with Eduardo, we are telling you about the communities and how to use these communities and the different services that can be used as operators. When you work with communities, this is a service that is offered and that can be used. So this is just the identification we include in our route. So as Eduardo already explained, the concept of community is not so complex. The difference, how does this, services, options, there are several operations, for example, you have the black holing, this is a case that can be used, so that your clients can use this. We're not going to see the practical aspects to see how this occurs on the provider side, how the operators implement this in their networks, how this works at the IX level, how a community does proceeds in the IX side, on the IX side. Let us look at some examples. Let me try to share my screen now. Here we are. This here is the example, the first case. Let me explain this, and there was a question regarding this point. If the doubt persists, I will try to explain further. Now, what was this case number one about? This is a case of route leakage. This means that there are routes that are exclusive for the IXPR and are leaking out. And why would this be a problem? This is because in theory, that which is included in the IX should not go out to the internet because precisely that is a traffic exchange. It should be the peering done between the participants. 
né? Você pode ter acordos específicos, né? Para acessar so, um mais longe. The could be specific agreements to reach a more distant place, but by default, this should work as follows. Then, when we try to reference what is IX, we have to distinguish between what is IX and the internet. For the BGP, there is no difference. So, for the purpose of configuring the BGP, this is all the same configuration. If I am receiving an announcement through ix.br or in a different way for the purposes of BGP, this is the same. I am receiving IP routes and I'm including these in the router. For the purpose of BGP routing, I cannot figure out what one is or the other. In this case, why do we have leakage? Well, precisely because it cannot distinguish between the two types of information. So what can we do? I can work with communities to see what I can do in this case. Here you have the configurations for the solution. The important thing with the communities is to know what we can do with the communities. I can, for example, put a community here for those routes that I learned through the internet, what I learned as community one, what I learned through PDP or IXPR, I call it community two. So in my network, this is how I can reference the two things because one will be identified as community number one and the other will be identified as community number two. So if I wish to do any changes in how these routes are treated, I have additional information which I did not have previously. This is a great advantage of working with communities. This is useful to better organize the route configuration that we have in our network. So the way we proceed will depend on the configuration of the networks, of the devices in the network. In this case, we're using a Cisco example, but the configurations are equivalent for other routers as well. So practically all the routers work today with communities Juniper, Microtik, and many more. And even the open source ones, the open BGPs, they also have community support. So the type of router is not that relevant because most of them do support communities. So the only thing that will chain is the syntax of the command that you have to do. Therefore, you, it is important to know what you wish to be done. In this case, in the example of case number one, this is what we do in practice. I am applying here in the bottom router a rule that is this one here. This is the AS here, the 04. What you get here from AS04, I'm including here a community 64502 colon 100. So everything that reaches here from this AS04, I even included a filter for the prefix list to be sure that the AS4 doesn't include other things, but it wouldn't be necessary. Whatever you get here from 04 is being classified. This is the first thing that I'm doing. So it therefore verifies in the prefix list, prefix list, you include the community there and all the rest is then discarded. Then what are we going to do up here? Up here, we're going to create an output and this will 
only distinguish that which comes from community number 100. So what occurs here, where do I learn the community 100? Where do I learn about this? This is only used from where I'm placing it. This is the internet. So only the things that I learned from the internet will be propagated up here. The things that I learn from the ix.br will not be propagated because I'm not including any community here. I could do it. I could also do it in the other the other way around. I could include a community from my ix and then disseminate to the internet everything from there. So the effect would be the same. Therefore, the way in which we will find a solution can vary. Here, we have to be creative to find solutions to these problems. You don't have just one single way to do so. There are always several possibilities to work with this. So this is a concept and that is the important part to understand what happens over here. And the problem here is when this connection is interrupted, then it might occur that information leaks out via ix.br. It might sound good because AS1 will S1 will know how to go on to S4, but this should not be, be the case because access to the internet for IS4 was interrupted. So I then have no way to reach there because this connection would be interrupted, though it might sound good in practice. This is what we wouldn't want to happen in this other scenario here, precisely because this, it is not internet what you're accessing. This is done through the ix.br. I will now go over to our lab. The lab is very simple. This is a topology. What I did here was to change this to routers. I simplified things a bit. Here, it doesn't have anything because in practice, for the participant, this is as if there were nothing anyway. So that is where we find it difficult to distinguish what is internet and what is not, because for the BGP purposes, it is the same. So we, here we have this scenario, which I'm showing you. Let us have a look at the setup. I have the routers over here from one to four. This is router number four that is making the announcement. It announces here, we put that in router number four. Here we put BGP. So here we have two sessions. Remember one for number two and these are two sessions that are established. If we wish to see what I am announcing for each of these, which is the same announcement, then we will see the slash 32. This is 2001 DB8 slash 32, both for the neighbor on the left and the one on the right. I'm going to change the IP address here and put the same IPv6 address slash 32. So this is the only announcement that is made in the laboratory. Router number four sends it to three and two. This is then propagated to router number one. So let us see how router number one sees this path slash 32. Let us write here route number one, route number one, and the BGP session. Let's see what it receives. See, see here, for those of you who never saw a BGT table, this is a line for a BGP table. You see a BGP table has many, many paths. 
basically there are 900,000 lines like you have here. You have the network, the next hub, the metric. So how do you read this? This is a slash 32. To reach it, I have to access here to FD00 colon colon one, which is IP of router number two. And the path is how I reach the slash 32. So I read, go through AS02 and I reach AS04. This is exactly what you see in this sketch. Router 4, Router 2, and Router 1. This is a path that I learned through BGP. This is the normal way it works. It is correct. There is no problem in this scenario. Now let us introduce a problem. Let us interrupt this connection between Router 4 and Router number 2. You can do this in different ways. I'm going to interrupt it here, interrupt the connection at this level. I'm going to do a shutdown here in the neighbor. And this should interrupt the connection with router number two. If we put show IPv6 BGP summary, we see here that this session is no longer active. It was stopped, the connection was interrupted. So now between routers number four and routers number two, nothing else occurs. So this is what happened. Now let us look what router one learned through BGP. What happened now? I continue receiving the slash 32, but now look at the AS path now. AS 60502, 503, and 504. So what path is being used now? It comes this way to router 1, router 2, router 3, and route, uh, router 4. So this is a typical route leakage because here this route should not be propagated. It shouldn't come go on in this direction in because there is no internet here. So this is what we wish to avoid in this scenario. Now let us see how we can avoid this kind of situations. How shall we proceed then? Here we have the community list rules. We have to create the community number 100 and include this in what I have learned through router number four. So I take the slash 32, I'm going to insert in that slash 32, the community 100. And when propagating it, I'm only going to propagate the information with my community 100. If it doesn't have the community 100, it won't send it further. And this is what the rules are doing, the community rules are doing. So now we're going to apply this to router number two, because router number two is the one that is leaking out these routes. We're going to configure this. We're going to insert the community, community list 100. We're going to create this route map, this exit route map. Now create the prefix list for the slash 32. I'm going to create this other route map which validates traffic. And then I will apply it. Here we have the rules and the logic. We have to apply it 
than in those BGP session, the BGP sessions. That is applied, BGP 64502. We're going to enter the BGP, the IPv6, and we apply. Beleza. Né? Então, the neighbor rules. So then we exit configuration and we now put show the community rules. Let us look at the configuration rules and transit. And the route apps that we created. So we'll now see if this, if this solves the problem we had, the problem with router number one. I'm going to restart the session, the BGP session, so that the table, the BGP table can be updated. So I'm going to click on the BGP I wait a couple of seconds and then the connection is once again established. So it is now learning. You see now it is didn't learn more. These are the routes that came from route number four. It's no longer going through router number three and number two because they don't have the same community. What is coming is that path that I interrupted. So that behavior is what we would expect because now it is no longer a route leakage of what came from the IXPR. So route number one will not have access number four because it has no other path to the internet to reach that router. So that is a point. It can no longer reach it because it doesn't have access to the internet. It has an ac access through IX, but this is something different. It is separate. So this is the expected behavior. Is that okay? Now we have the behavior, there are no further route leaks, but we need to see that once this connection is resumed, if I can learn this route, because I prevent the leakage, but I'm not propagating the correct route. So let us test this. This is a connection. And now what we're going to see we put here show IPv6 BGP summary. Let's see if we can then propagate this to the routers. This now re-established it. I'm going to restart this session in order to update the BGP information. Deve estabelecer de novo aqui a, a so, sessão. this session should be established right away. Agora, olha só, né? As rotas aprendidas são and uma. Now, look at the routes. There's only one. So, I came back to the slash 32. This is the solution that we applied successfully. There's no it's no longer propagating what came uh, from uh, the IX, but I am accepting uh, that for the internet. So I just create something that I say this is internet and what doesn't have it, it's not, uh, should not uh, be sent any further. So community has that characteristic. It's a simple concept. So I need to know how do I configure that? so that that will help me in uh, situations that I'm facing in my network. It doesn't mean that I need to apply it in your net network, but think of the difficulties that you may have to make something operational. What is the big advantage of a community? 
is the automation of some of the processes in your networks. So you can see that after I create the botnets, the, the route maps, I don't need to continue to touch this. Afterwards, I just but what I propagate what is in the, in the community so I can figure it only once I don't need to go back to it. That is why the operators like the community so much because it makes uh, life easier when you're operating. You want to do the black holing, you want to do this, there's no need for you to call and to ask to filter the IXP, but we just put the black hole community and the router will do that automatically. You shouldn't worry anymore. So this is the big advantage of the community. So it uh, makes the process more automatic uh, in the network and the community can be a community of 100% internal. Nobody knows that that community exists in your network, but you can use it to make your life easier. It is not because um, you work with the community that you have to offer that as a service. That's not the idea. It is just to make life easier. It's something that makes it easier to, to configure the network. And you have this type of community, so there is that type of community that helps configure internally. You don't need to disseminate it outside. So if any of you have any doubts, please put it in the Q&A, put it in, uh, uh, in the panel, and we are going to answer. So this, is, this was the first case of uh, leaks of uh, routes in IX. And now let's see the other side. That is the part of one as participant in the XBR. IXBR. I want to use the communities that exist in IXBR. So what do I have to do first? We go to the site of IXBR. And here I want to see what communities I want to, to use and Eduardo presented a list and he showed it in his uh, uh, slides and some of the communities, but how do I get that information? I go to IXBR, I go to doc, general documentation. And so here I have all the information about the project of IXBR. What are the projects that you are looking for? Route server appearing, so we have a new um, uh, policy for treating the BGP communities in IXBR. So this document will tell you which are the communities that exist today in uh, IXBR, and it also describes how we can uh, um, how we work with the communities, what they are uh, for, if you have the RPK filter. And you just have to read that document because here it describes what each of them does. So you have the description of the communities that are used. And in this other document, um, table of BGP communities, it also says new, and this is where I can check where each community is. So most IXBR localities have some communities that can be used. There are some lo localities that have more communities available. So how do I know what you have and where? So you use this table. In this site, I have the communities. It says, here it says, not announced to ASN specifically. And where I can use this community? I can use it where there's a check here, where it's checked. In Aracaju, Belen, Belo Horizonte, Brasilia, and here. So you go and look at each state and each uh, site where that community is available, because there are some communities that are not uh, available. For instance, this one, Graceful Shutdown, is not available in Aracaju, it, uh, but it is available in Campinas. So 
depending on where you are, you need to check the table to see what is available where you are. What are the communities that are available there? We have several. I am in Aracaju, for instance, and I don't have the community that I need. Somehow, sometime, will they be available in Aracaju? Yes, the idea is that in all the localities, they may have those communities available, starting with uh, some, look, we start with some localities in the, here in the specific case of Campinas and Victoria, just to test whether everything was working. And then if everything is working, we try in other localities. If in your locality you don't have the community that you need yet, certainly they will be available in the future. That shouldn't be a matter of concern. For this test, I'm going to use the I, uh, Victoria, Victoria's, the IX of Victoria, because it's where we have most new communities. I'm going to show you how you would, you would use the IXPR services. It's very simple. I'm going to show you a list of the configuration. What do I do in this lab? I announce uh, two announcements of slash 48 or IPv6, 2801-8017-F1 slash 48. What is the difference between this one and this one? Basically, in this one in, in has this community and the other one is without a community. What is that community 65011 uh, colon uh, um, uh, 10? It, uh, it says do not announce to losses over 10%. What does this mean in practice? That IX measures the, uh, with the participants and measures the loss of packets and classifies that now and then. So if the connection with the participant is bad, then it will classify with a loss and a percentage. And so when you apply this, the participants that have losses over 10% will not receive that announcement or, or the rest will receive it, the slash 48. But the participants that have larger losses won't receive it. Why is that interesting? Well, it would depend a lot on what you need. But if you need the connections that you have with IX to be highly reliable, it might be interesting to apply these filters precisely not to announce the connections that have problems. So this would be a possibility. But it, it varies. It varies depending on the situation of each. Why is this important? It's important to think of, in your scenario, what is important for you? That is, the rule is very simple. And it seems a lot to what we saw in the previous example in the community. Here you see the announcement of the slash 48. Here we don't put anything. And we do not. Uh, uh, we do not uh, permit it. There, I configure it in the router, and until this uh, is just uh, and uh, in the looking glass, it, it takes some time. So I leave it here. Let me see whether I can show you in the router. I'm here. IX. Vitoria and the IX of Vitoria has two road servers. So there I have two BGP sessions and they are the same, but I have 1,404 routes in each and only for you to see the announcements that uh, I am disseminating. And here, there are other announcements that I mentioned. So this is 
2008 one AD17 F1 and slash 48. These are the ones that I am disseminating with the IX of Victoria. And here there's another very important part. I know that I am transmitting this to slash 48. Now, what happens on the other side of the counter? Are people receiving what I am transmitting? Is everything working properly? Has nothing changed midway? So how do I know whether that is working? So here we have the concept of the looking glass. What is the looking glass? Basically, it's a router. It's a mirror of the router that you have, the BGP, that you release for the outsiders to consult the announcements in that router. Why is this interesting? Because we manage to see the other side of the counter, how the announcements reach them. So I configured the slash 48 so that they would be announced in IX. Now, has it has IX worked well? Did IX receive it well? They didn't discard them. Did anything happen? So I go and I I look at the looking glass of IXBR to see the IXBR, the access for looking glass, and I look for the town that is Vitoria. So let's look in the route servers. Here we are in two. Let's look for this. Here you have a list of all the participants that are connected in the IX in Vitoria. For this test, I used the AS of OpenCDN to check the announcements that are being uh, transmitted. So here I found the slash 48 that I announced. 2801, 80, 17F0, for slash 48, and the other one is the same, but with F1. So remember, what did we do? 17F0 has the community, and 17F1 uh, doesn't have a community. So let's see what appears in F1, the one that doesn't have anything, that doesn't have a community. When you click on that, what do you see? You see that there are many communities. Look at this. All these. Why? Because let's remember that IXDR has the informational communities. Those informational communities, it's not you that you put them, but the IX itself inserts them as additional information about the announcement. So this is also something very interesting for the community. So with, of all this information, all this information, I can receive it only through the community. So I know that it's a Brazilian ASN and the measurement uh, comes in the mil, 10 mil, under 10 milliseconds, 0% packet loss. And it is announced through this uh, uh, and it's also announced in the IX of Victoria. It's, a, it's valid in the, the IXBR. This isn't registered in the regional register. So how would this include it in the IXBR? So this is a bit more complicated because there you have some scripts and external bases for that information. But you take this announcement and then you classify this according to these communities. These are the communities that are in the document of ix.br. So you go to the website of ix.br and see the documents containing that information. So if you're going to access another provider, you will have different numbers. That is most likely. So this standard is adopted 
by ix.br. Here, we have several descriptions that provide additional information regarding the announcement that we made. So now let us look at this one here, F0, that is the one that might lead to losses above 10%. See how interesting this is. Here you have the community, no export to packet loss, which is greater than 10%. So it did receive this. It received the correct community. So what will happen now? F1 to all the participants of Victoria and that will be for losses lesser than 10%. Those have larger losses than 10% will not receive it. So this is an example of a community, an action community. I apply it to my route, to my path, and I see that on the other side, action will be taken on this. Here, the announcements are being filtered for some of the participants. And this, the same concept of no export or only export. All these are examples of action communities. And this is included in the announcement and something happens within the IX. The information communities are the other ones and it's not myself who's including it. This is a task done by IX.br. This is very simple. The sense in which we work with the communities, because work has already been done. So this, my task just consists in including this in the announcement. The programming has been done. So if I have the community service, this is much simpler because the work has been done. If I have a contract with the operator and then the operator sends me the list of the communities it offers. These are services that are ready to be used. So it is very simple in that sense. But nothing prevents me from applying these rules in my provider. If there are some things that can be useful for me, I can also do this in the network as would be the case of preventing route leakage. This is a service which makes my life easier. So the use of communities is something that is very wide. You can use this as a service. You can use this as an internal application and also for better organizing myself to know what comes from where. So there are n amounts of possibilities that I can do for the communities. So I think that maybe this is not about how to use it, but what could I do with the communities in my own network that and things that I can solve in my network with these communities. These are just some examples, some scenarios to show you what you can do using communities. So this is what I had to share with you. How you apply communities which is 100% internal and how you would apply an action community to make this as it's available to you as a service. So you have to just look at the network and what the provider contains. If you have any questions, please include this in the Q&A box so we can answer these questions for you. Thank you, Tiago. So now let us go over to the Q&A session. 
Hernán, please let us know if there are any questions in the panel for Tiago. Yes, there is a question here from Oscar Javier Cárdenas Bernal, and he says, for the case number one of fraud leakage, when you apply these measures, is this, do you have a period of service outage? If there is a service outage between AS 64502 and 64504, or if you just applied the route map and the suggested configuration, do you achieve an instantaneous route convergence? How does this work? Tiago, can you hear me? I think that the idea of, of my presentation, you ended up showing that case of route leakage. If a BGP session crashed, you have time to identify it. So I think you have about a minute and a half to determine whether this is functioning or not. And normally, this applies rapidly and then you won't have route leakage because this is only something that so the route won't appear in the catalog and this won't be exported. 